You're listening to episode 78, Finding Your Voice Through the Help of Music with Beth Durbin. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome to this week's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate having you here, as always. And this week, I guess you could say, is part three of a little uh, three-part series that I've had going on here with uh, individuals who've been affiliated with A Voice for the Innocent, which is the organization that we first heard about back in episode 74 with Jamie Cyrus. And today I'm going to be joined by Beth Durbin, who is the lead singer of a band called Glass World based out of Ohio. And they've just uh, partnered up with uh, Jamie and A Voice for the Innocent and have been uh, helping them out recently, and, and Beth will tell us more about that during the episode. Uh, and before we get into today's episode, I do want to let you know that it's brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks, and I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30 day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an MP3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you'll be able to go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So Beth's going to talk with us today about how she grew up uh, being sexually abused by her mom's romantic partners over the years and, you know, how that affected her and how she didn't get to meet her dad until she was 17 years old. And she's going to talk about how she kept quiet about her story for 20 years, uh, but how helping others has been able to help her. And we're going to talk about the importance of getting your story out there. And she's going to talk about why she shared her story anonymously uh, after she had started talking about it publicly because she shared it um, anonymously through A Voice for the Innocence website. And, you know, she's going to talk about why that was still a scary thing to do, uh, even though nobody knew who the person was behind the story. And then she's going to talk about how she got into the music scene and how that has helped her to heal and how music has given her a voice and we're also going to talk about the struggles of being in a relationship while healing. So if you've enjoyed the past two episodes, I know you're definitely going to enjoy this one as well. And so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into it. And I'm going to bring Beth on. Beth, welcome to the podcast. And thank you for joining me here today to share your story with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Melissa. Yeah, absolutely. So you and I uh, also got connected through past guest, Jamie Cyrus of A Voice for the Innocent. Um, I was telling you just before we started recording that I've had Bethany Ellen and Erin O'Callaghan on as well. And I'm excited to get into your story here today. I know that you've been using music as a way to express your feelings about what you've been through. So I'll definitely want to hear more about that. Music has played a big part in the healing of some of my past guests, and it has for me as well. So Beth, what I like to do is start with your story and have you share with us what you'd like us to know about what you experienced growing up, and then we'll go from there. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. Yeah, great. So yeah, just kind of tell us, like, when did it all begin for you? I guess we'd have to go back to 1987, Okay. Um, a very rural part of Florida. My mom was a sophomore in high school, and she ended up getting pregnant with me. And that was kind of the scandal of the town, you know, and it, it just put her in a really uncomfortable place. Uh, so my grandparents at the time felt that 
it was best to leave Florida and to move up to Ohio to just give her a new life and them a new start um, because they were very religious. So a scandal like this with an unmarried 16-year-old, you know, kind of tarnished their reputation down there. And they just felt like a new area and a new start would be for the best. So they came up here to Ohio with me in tow. I was about six days old. And my mom had to really grow up early. You know, she was then strapped with a, a baby. She was finishing high school, and she actually went on to finish college as well with my grandparents' help, uh, which was all great. Those were, you know, good goals for her, and she did it even with a kid. Um, but she wasn't done growing up, so I spent a lot of my time with my grandparents, uh, especially early on growing up. Uh, my mom was still trying to find her place in the world, I think. She was still trying to figure herself out and... Me, you know, being as young as I was, that was kind of a hardship that she wasn't ready to face. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she she had many boyfriends. She was, you know, single mom. She was a teenager. Um, so a lot of her decisions, you know, kind of affected me. And uh, I was about five years old. I started getting uh, some male attention from her boyfriends. You know, they would sit with me or they would come and talk to me and, you know, to anybody, it, it would have just seemed like they were being nice and they were trying to pay attention to the kid in the room that, you know, of the, the mom that they were dating. But some things just weren't appropriate. And I learned later on, you know, of course, what that was. But when I was six years old, I had been laying in bed. I was homesick from school, actually. And one of her boyfriends was still there. And he decided, I guess, that, you know, six-year-old in bed, might as well just mess around with her. Mm. Uh, my mom was not there. And uh, I, I didn't know that it was wrong. I didn't know that the attention that I was receiving was anything different than, you know, the affection I had seen them give my mother or the affection that I had been shown throughout my life. I didn't know that, you know, a, a grown man inappropriately touching a six-year-old was wrong. You know, I was only six. My mind had not fully grown to a point to where I understood exactly what all was going on. So for, for me, it, it started very early. It started at six and then it continued um, for a while. Different times, of course, different times. Uh, my mom married. She was married twice, actually. And uh, the second husband, he was a bit more emotionally abusive, but he would touch me sometimes and that would be, you know, uncomfortable. But yeah, you know, early on, it was just, I had this false sense of what the world was and what affection was and what love was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, were you able to tell your mom about it at this point? No, I, I was so far, I guess, from understanding it that I never voiced it. And I kind of just held it to myself. You know, me and my mom uh, were extremely disconnected uh, throughout my life for many years, actually. And I never felt like it was my place. I, I always felt like these, these men were temporary, and they usually were. I'd see them for a couple of weeks, and then they'd be gone. Um, and so I, I knew that the things that were happening weren't going to last forever. And I also knew that these men, you know, as, you know, immature or whatever they were, they were making my mom happy. And that was something that was often brought up to me a lot. You know, well, I have to take care of you. And it was almost like it was a, a dig every time, you know. So my mom being happy was kind of important to me at that point and what I understood to be her priority. Mm. So it sounds like you felt like you couldn't really talk about it. No. No, yeah. I didn't. And then when did this finally end? When when were you no longer being abused any, anymore? Well, I, like I said, she was married twice. Um, and her second husband had, by the time I was a teenager, he had, I guess, realized that I was not to be controlled. Um, I had began acting out in school for most of my time in school. I was disconnected from my mother um, I was disconnected from him. I had had many boyfriends at that point, you know, before I was 15. Um, and he had just, I guess, got to a place of where he was just tired of trying to 
control me, control her. And so I was about 17 when everything tapered off and ended. And I had actually um, started a relationship with someone that uh, was pretty tame in my book and what I had known um, guys to be. He wasn't experienced. He was very sheltered, if you will. And he was just a breath of fresh air. And so we had dated for many months uh, before I had told him, you know, what had occurred in my own life. And around that same time, I had uh, finally told my father, who I had met that year when I was 17 as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So you hadn't even met your dad up until this point. No. Uh, yeah. when, my, and- when my mom and my grandma and grandpa left Florida, they failed to inform my father that I was born, that they were moving You know, and they hadn't put him on the birth certificate either. So he had really no right to me at that time. Um, And all he got from authority, you know, from lawyers and stuff was you're going to have to wait until she seeks you out after she's 18. And I had always been curious about him and, you know, and I had always wanted to know about him. Um, But nobody was at liberty to tell me and Mm -hmm. to tell me what they had decided you know, all those years ago about me and my life and where he fit into it all. Mm -hmm. So what was that like for you getting to meet him? It was very surreal. You know, it's, it's funny because I had grew up the whole time thinking that I had looked like my mom and that I had these features and these uh, character details that were just like my mom. I had been told that I was just like my mom many times throughout my life. But when I met my father, I instantly was like, no, I am just like my dad. <laughs> it was mm. it was very surreal uh, when I saw him. I was just, I just knew he was my dad. I, I knew almost immediately that is my father. And it, it was nice. You know, it, he, he filled the void for a normal male relationship in my life that I had never had. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Because even though your mom had uh, different boyfriends, it, it wasn't anything that would come close to being a, a father figure for you. And of course, you know, they, they had been abusive towards you anyway. So correct. Yeah. Um, now, when did you tell your mom about what had happened to you? Uh, I eventually told her um, I was well into my 20s, actually. Uh, after I had met my father, uh, she had decided that she wasn't going to talk to me if I was going to fulfill a relationship with him. And I think that, it, you know, many years now, you know, we had all came down to, to it that she just didn't want me to find out, you know, what all they had decided and that they had left Florida so suddenly with me. Um, so when that happened, I had stopped talking to her for about two years. And finally, she came back into my life, said that she wanted to be into my life, Um, and that she wanted to apologize for everything that, you know, had happened. And I finally had a heart to heart with her. And I said, you know, I needed a mom and I know that that time is over, but I, I think there's a few things that I need to tell you about. And I did, I was very open with her, you know, my then husband at the time and my father both felt that I needed to tell her. So we just had a sit down and she was very remorseful. She was very you know, sorry for everything that had happened. And she was very, I think her eyes were opened about it, that all this time that she had been searching for herself and trying to make herself happy, there was her daughter who was suffering and she had no idea. That must have made you feel a little bit better about things, you know, to kind of to, to get... It did. It, so, it, was, support. it was almost like that was another weight that was lifted, you know, there was a weight lifted when I told my boyfriend, there was a weight lifted when I told my father. And then when I told my mother, there was another weight lifted. Uh, But it still wasn't over. You know, it Mm -hmm. it still was very present in my mind. And I was still going through a lot of things that um, that were affecting me every day, actually. Yeah, so I'd like to talk a little more about that now. And what those things were. I mean, we talked a little bit about how you were affected then when you were growing up. Um, but how did this carry on into your adulthood? What what did it look like? How was that playing out? Um, I had developed, um, they, they call it sensory dysfunction, and mainly it affects children. But at the time, you know, in the 90s, no, everybody just called you a bad kid. 
so they didn't really have a name for it. They didn't really know what it was. And I didn't even know what it was until a few years ago. But yeah, I had developed this sensory dysfunction to where, you know, I wasn't the most affectionate person. I didn't like to be touched. Um, and yet I felt the need to dominate my relationship. So I had really became standoffish and I had really became, uh, someone that didn't really enjoy being around someone that she had, she loves, you know, my husband went through a great deal of, I, I guess his feelings were hurt for many years because he thought it was him. And when in fact, you know, it was me and I hadn't, mm. hadn't quite figured it out yet. Right. You couldn't convey that to him. Right. And it was very hard to even put a name on it, to even label it, to even figure out what it was. So I, I had to go through counseling and I had to dig through a lot of that and uh, really come to with everything. I had to change my mindset. I had to think on, on a whole new level. Um, it was like a whole new side of my brain was uncovered through counseling. And that's when it was it was all becoming very clear and when I was able to start managing it from day to day. Mm. And when was it that you began counseling? Um, I started counseling actually a few years ago. So okay. here I am, I'm 28. You know, this had been going on since I was six years old and I had kept it quiet for, you know, 20 years. So it, it was something that you know, needed to be done 20 years ago, you know, but unfortunately, I, I guess better late than never. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but I'm sure there was a lot to process after keeping it all in for all that time. Uh, there was. I, I actually told my counselor when I walked in, I said, I hope you have a really big notebook. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I do. And I have the time. And we went through it for, I, you know, I, I haven't been to counseling, thankfully, um, in about nine months. So that's that's where I am with it today. Yeah, that's great. And you feel like you're doing good without it? I am. I, I put a lot into my music. Uh, I write lyrics pretty much all the time. Uh, music's been a deep center of my world for about 11 years. And it's always been a, a place where I could express it and relate and get it out there and, and help others. I feel like helping other people has helped me more than anything. And that is why I got involved with Jamie uh, when he started A Voice for the Innocent. He he actually was sitting in my kitchen and he said, look, I know you're very expressive about that time in your life, you know, in the band and stuff. You've written songs about it, but are you interested in, you know, being a part of this? And I, I said, absolutely, because every time that I've been able to talk to someone or get someone else help, it's it's helped me tremendously. Yeah. How did you guys first get connected? Was it him that had reached out to you? Uh, it's funny. Actually, I had met Jamie uh, back in 2008, I want to say. We were actually in Kentucky and he was playing a music festival and he was in a band at the time. And, you know, with, with bands, you never think that other bands, you're going to develop these lifelong friendships or these relationships with these people. You just think, oh, I'm going to share the stage and, you know, then be done with it. But uh, with Jamie, we had come in contact so many times and we had played so many shows together that it was hard for us not to become friends. And that's exactly what happened. And I had started to to know a little bit about Jamie's life and about what had happened to him through music. And we had had many conversations about it. So when he came to me about A Voice for the Innocent, I said, you know, absolutely, without a doubt. That's great. What sorts of things have you done for them? Um, well, I've done anything from promotion to I've, I've obviously shared anonymously on their website. I have written songs. Um, they had a compilation a couple years back, uh, I believe in 2012, and my band at the time had written a song specifically for that compilation. Um, I've modeled for them with their t-shirts. I've had them at as many shows as I possibly can get them on. I know that if, you know, my band is playing a big night, then I try to ask the promoter or the venue if A Voice for Innocent can get a booth. Um, I'm very vocal about them on stage, um, and I, I'm very vocal about, you know, what they're about. I keep all of their reading materials and their merch on, on my table as well. So as much as I'm selling my band's merchandise, I'm trying to get people interested in what they're doing, too. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, he's got a great thing going there yeah that organization he really does especially in the music scene which is very saturated with sex and mm. it's 
it's a place where I've met the most people that have come forward about sex abuse. Mm, yeah, that's, so that that's that's great that you're, you guys have partnered up in that way. For sure. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something you were talking about um, when you were talking about having gone to therapy. And it sounds like that was a really good experience for you. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, so for a lot of people, I mean, they have a hard time kind of finding a good therapist, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, How how did you end up finding yours just out of curiosity? You know, was it, it, was it, did you have to go through like a process of trying out different ones or did it just kind of work for you with the first person? I was actually kind of lucky, honestly. I, I had felt I, I'd have a, I had a lot of problems uh, two years ago. You know, my my marriage was starting to fall apart, and I was at the make it or break it point. It was either we were going to work, and I was going to work through my demons, or we were going to separate. And you know, I was going to continue down this cycle, this path with everything. So I had actually joined a local group. Uh, called Celebrate Recovery. And at first, I thought it was just for drug addicts. Um, But I learned very quickly that it wasn't. Uh, It was actually for people recovering from all sorts of things. And mine was included. Um, And so one of the leaders had suggested that their uh, on-site counselor was available. And they, they actually had a man and they had a woman available. And I said, well, I would most, most, uh, before a a woman than I would for a man. I, do, I couldn't see sitting down with a man and, you know, unveiling my deepest, darkest secrets. So mm-hmm. they set me up with her and uh, she called me. And the first time I, you know, I walked in, I, like I said, I told her, I hope you have a big notebook. And she said, I do. And I have the time. And she said, before we even get started, she said, if you don't feel comfortable with me, at all, she said, then I will find you someone. And that, that really set me at ease. You know, she told me a little bit about herself. She told me about what type of counselor she was and who all she mainly dealt with. And I, I feel like there was a sense of trust that was already established there when she was telling me about her and her personality and how many daughters she had. And, you know, there, there was just a little bit of, of trust that was already established there. And I just felt really comfortable about it. And I know that people aren't, you know, that lucky. I know that A lot of people have went through three or four or five counselors and they still haven't found anybody that they can talk to. Um, But with me, it, it, it honestly, it, it ended up being pretty incredible. That's great. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was kind of the same thing. You know, I, I got lucky with the first therapist that, uh, that I, that I came across. Yeah. uh, It's also very, um, I don't know. It feels like, another weight is gone. You know, it's like, great. Now I don't have to search for anybody. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, that can be a whole process. In yeah. And of itself. Yeah. Like, it, yeah, I can imagine like you finally get to a point where you want to go to therapy, mm-hmm. right? you want to go deal with it and then you can't find someone. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if only, you know, everybody could be that lucky because yeah, like you say, I mean, some people have to go through a few before they can find someone or well, they never really do find someone. So that's exactly. But. It, it is. And it's it's one of those to where I've talked to those people, too. You know, the people that have come to me at my shows or, you know, wherever and have told me I just can't find a therapist. I always encourage them to tell their story anonymously. And I usually direct them to a Voice for an Innocent site because I feel like if you can at least get it out, if it's in word form, if it's in music, if it's in poetry, if it's talking to somebody if you can at least get it out, then that opens the first door that you need, need to start the healing process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know you said that you wrote your story anonymously for um, A Voice for the Innocent as well, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I had encouraged people during Jamie's episode to go and check out uh, the organization and, you know, possibly consider sharing their stories there if, if they haven't told it to anyone yet. Um, so what was that experience like for you? I mean, and I don't remember if you had said you had started talking about it publicly already at this point. Yes, or... at this point, I had been talking about it um, through my music. And I had been, you know, my family knew at that point. But 
it almost wasn't enough, you know, like it was at that point to where I wasn't considering counseling. It was at that point where I was like, you know, I need to, I need to really dig in and get this out. And I didn't want to give the gory details to my dad or to my mom. I didn't want to give the gory details to my husband. Um, I wanted it to just be a story. I wanted it to just be out there. And I felt like if I could just get it on paper and, you know, get it out there that it would, it would help. And it did it, you know, as I wrote it, I, I I probably wrote it and rewrote it about 10 times. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I, I probably sat there around that, you know, on that submit button for a good hour before I even submitted it, because there's always that doubt of, in this day and age, especially of where, okay, I'm going to put this out there and someone's going to be hateful, even though that, I didn't I didn't think that would happen. You know, A Voice for the Innocent is very inclusive. Everyone that has ever commented before or been able to help, you know, anonymously has been nothing but uplifting and just sharing their story, too, and wanting the same thing you were wanting. But there was still that little bit of fear of, OK, I'm putting this out there for someone to judge me, for someone to be hateful to me. Or, you know, I, I guess I was still getting over that whole it's my fault thing. Mm -hmm. which was very, very, very hard process, you know, for, for many years, it was, well, it it was just me, but I submitted it anyway. And I was so glad that I did because within the hour I received a first, you know, comment about it. And it was just so uplifting and it was just so encouraging. It was just like, okay, someone else is hearing me. And then by the end of it, I mean, I had well over 200 comments on the thing and I just felt at ease with it. You know, it it helped me for that moment and it got it out there. And that's when I was like, "Mm, maybe I should consider getting into this further and getting counseling. Mm, That's great. And so even though it was anonymous, like you still had that fear of being judged because you knew that this was your work. And so, right. So if someone was saying something bad about it, Um, that was still going to affect you, even though they didn't know who wrote it. Right. Deeply, you know, because everybody's internet warriors these days and you put something out and, you know, you you might get a hundred likes on it or you might get a thousand good comments about it, but all it takes is that one comment to just absolutely destroy you. And Mm -hmm. something like that on such a deep level um, of just debauchery, you're just kind of sitting there like, man, I hope, you know, I really hope that this is received well, even though it's a horrible story, you know, but I hope that it's received well. I hope that it's somebody encourages me. I hope that maybe it encourages somebody else that I found an outlet like music, you know, to do this with. I don't know. So, right. Cause you're bearing your soul and you don't absolutely don't want it to be, you don't want it to be judged. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other thing that you bring up there that is that, um, even though you had sort of started telling people about it, you weren't you weren't comfortable like getting into a lot of the details at that time. Right. Uh, so this gave you a way to get to put those details out there, but without having um, to share it with your name behind it. Correct. So yeah, so I think that's also um, a good thing for people to keep in mind if um, if they're considering uh, writing uh, writing their story on a, on a voice for the innocent, that even if they've already started sharing it a little bit, um, but they're in in a situation like you were in where you weren't comfortable getting into those details, then then by all means, you know, they can they can do that there and reap the benefit of getting all those details out without anyone needing to know. Absolutely. Who yeah. The person is behind it. Yeah. I, I think that that can be huge for a lot of people because you've got people walking around that you'd probably never know that something happened in their life. They probably would never want you to know that something happened, but they can go on to the site and they can share this story and you never put a face to it because the last thing anybody wants to be treated as is a victim. You know, I, I know that a voice for innocent, you know, says that, you know, we're helping sex victims and, you know, stuff like that. And we very much are sex victims, Um, but you don't want to be treated like one, you know, at least for me, I I didn't want to get the story out and start telling people and, you know, make this a very public part of my life because I wanted sympathy or because I wanted, you know, some sort of different treatment. I wanted somebody to pity me. You know, I, I didn't want any of that. I wanted someone to know what it was like, relate to it, be able to get some help for it and then help others with it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's so important to be able to share like all of your story, you know, right. and in, in whatever form that is. I mean, if it has to be anonymous, that's fine. It, but it's it's about being able to just get the benefits of doing that because it's such a, a freeing thing to be able to do. Very. And with writing it, you know, you've got a little bit of a little bit of creative. Um, I don't know. You can just you can add your creativity to it. You know, I tried to put myself in that place because I am a writer and I think it helped me from a therapy standpoint even to do because I tried to think of myself as I was writing about someone else. And that way I knew that, okay, I'm writing this story. It's obviously biographical, um, but I want it to appear as though I'm a little bit disconnected from it so that I don't fall apart over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's great that you were able to do that. Uh, so I want to talk about music a little bit now. Sure. Um, <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure you don't. I'm sure you don't mind. Um, so you said it was about 11 years ago when you got into it. I I did. I my boyfriend at the time had been um, in bands, you know, and he had actually got me into the music scene when we started dating, and I just couldn't get enough of it, you know. As soon as I got into um, the local music scene, uh, I haven't ever left. <laughs> so, and I, I knew that I had to be a part of it. I knew that I didn't know how because I, I can't play an instrument, <laughs> but <laughs> I knew that I could write words and I knew that I could, you know, do lyrics. So I felt like that was a, a huge calling on my life. Mm, and what was it about it that appealed to you? Was it, was it the music itself? Was it the community? What, what about it? I think it was a little bit of all of it, honestly. You know, you've take you you're taking, um, and I'll just describe the scene that I first came into. You know, he was in a like a hardcore metal band at the time, and I had never I listened to rock music, but I had never listened to anything more aggressive than that. And I'm watching these guys, and they're just so passionate about what they're saying, and they're so passionate about what they're playing, and the people that are watching them are so passionate about it. And it was just like, I felt like almost every person in there had a sense of purpose. And I feel like everyone that was listening to these words and that was listening to these notes being played was just connected in some other way. And music did that, you know, like everybody was there. Everybody felt like a brother or a sister. And we were all just a huge community connected by music. That's great. Yeah. How would you say that or like what role would you say that it's played in helping you to heal? I think it made me vocal for the first time. You know, I, I'd always been an outspoken person. I'd always been, you know, the person that you knew exactly how I felt by how I looked or what I said. You know, I was, I'm very straightforward. But I feel like when I had a microphone in my hand for the first time that I could actually be vocal that I could actually come out with how I was feeling instead of just writing it down, that I could actually, you know, tell somebody about my experience instead of just writing about it. I think that that was, that was huge for me. I had been quiet for so long about so many things, but music allowed me to do that. It allowed me to just come out of my shell. Mm. Was it scary for you at all or did it just feel right to you? <laughs> the very first show, I I, pro I shook like a leaf. I really did. <laughs> I, I was so nervous and it was just, you know, it, it was the most nerve wracking thing I've ever done. But after that night, I, I've, I just felt like it just made me like I felt like it. I just really stepped into the role that I was born to fill, you know, like I just, I feel like it comes very naturally. Um, now styles have changed, you know, and I have definitely changed as an artist over the years, but I still feel like it's, it's a place like no other one every time I get a microphone in my hand and I step on stage. That's incredible. Yeah. I think that just speaks to the power of finding like your passion, you know, and the thing that, that you're good at and that excites you and, and just feels right for you. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So have there been other things that have helped you to get to where you are today beside, you know, music and therapy and that stuff? Absolutely. And the very big thing, um, probably the biggest thing in my life is my daughter. Um, I had her five and a half years ago and I never knew if I was going to really be a mom and I didn't know how good of one I was going to be. Um, I I had her, it wasn't planned, um, but it was very, very welcomed and very accepted. And I fell into it just like I did with music, you know, like the first day that I held her, it was just like I was instantly alive. It, I, I got even better feeling than I did from stepping on a stage. I felt like that um, changed me for the better as well, you know, because suddenly I'm holding this little bean and that I had made and I was just like, I have to be better for her. You know, like, it, especially, it, you know, my thoughts went wild. She's a girl and I got to protect her and I have to do this and I have to do that. But I feel like she has helped me more than anyone in my life, honestly. She is just a, a constant little ball of sunshine every day. And she uh, she's good at reminding you about, you know, what you need to do. She doesn't let you forget anything. Uh, so promises are kept, you know, and responsibility is there. And she just keeps you keeps you on track. Um, I think that she has been uh, probably the best gift of through all of this. That's really great. Yeah. And things are good with your husband as well. Yeah, very good. You know, we, uh, like I said, we had our struggle uh, two years ago and I, you know, finally got help. But, you know, today we we're, we're fine. We're finally on a good path. I'm finally, you know, through of my my issues. You know, yeah, I have my days, but they're nothing like they were. And all of the sensory issues and everything, you know, him and my daughter have helped me a great deal with. Um, so it's all very important to, to have it all out in the open. You know, that was very important for my family. It was very important for, you know, our marriage, for the healing of it. And uh, yeah, we're, we're doing really well today. That's great. Yeah, it can definitely be tough to, you know, be in a relationship when you're still healing and still trying to figure stuff out. Yeah, very much because, you know, he has his relationship goals, you know, things that he expected and wanted from a relationship. And, you know, when that's one sided, you know, when you're trying to figure out all of your stuff and what you're going through, you know, you're not thinking about all of that. So it was very one-sided for him for for many years. And now it's finally becoming two-sided. And mm -hmm. we're finally at a point to where we know what we want from, from this life and from this marriage and from, you know, being parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did he come from an abusive background or? Not at all. Not at all. He, yeah. he was, he was. Uh, that, that makes it even more difficult. Exactly. <laughs> you know, he's got the, he's got the picture perfect family, honestly. And I tell him that all the time, I, you know, that he's got a really good Christian based backed family. And, you know, they were all great. You know, his grandparents have been together since they were 14 and his other grandparents since they were 12 and his parents since they were 18. You know, like they've got these long family lines and relationships and friendships. And I knew none of that. You know, I, mm -hmm. I knew I knew tragedy very well. I knew relationships didn't last. I knew divorce very well. I knew abuse very well. Um, and, and it's just, it's how it was. You know, our, our worlds were completely different. But I think today he helps me and my daughter helps me seeing, you know, to see what is important, to see what is to strive for and to that it's not always hurt. It's not always abuse. It's not always, you know, got to be negative, that it can be brand new and it can be exciting and it can be a good relationship and a good household. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's great that you've been able to, to find that, you know, in spite of the family dynamics that you grew up in. Right. Yeah. Um, so how, how would you say you're doing overall today? Today is pretty good. You know, I, my, my band is doing well. Um, me and my husband and my daughter are all going to Disney World in a couple weeks. Nice. Um, my my career is doing well. Um, I have really good, solid friendships. I have good, solid, you know, relationships with my family. Um, after all it's said and done, you know, me and my family are in a really good place finally. And um, I, I, I'm doing well at home, doing well at, at work. So it all kind of it all kind of uh, works out really well today. But it wouldn't have, you know, if I had kept on the, the path that I was and just staying quiet about things and letting things just eat me alive, 
you know, it would have been a completely different story, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's great that things are going well in all areas of your life. Um, So tell us a little more about, you know, your band and and tell us their name and, you know, what kind of uh, music you guys play and (laughs) and what you have going on with them. Shameless plug here, right? (laughs) There you go. So... Yeah, my band, uh, we have been together for two years. I was in another band previous to this band uh, with my husband, actually. And that band was called The Rose Hill. That's the band that I met Jamie in. And, you know, we we were together for years. We were together for about seven years. And um, that kind of split up when, you know, me and my husband uh, fell apart or I had to get help and everything. That was done. And I started this new band called Glass World. And I, I started it from a place that's exactly like the title. You know, glass is, is very fragile. It can be broken very easily. And there were many aspects Um, behind that name, you know, of my life where I felt like life is fragile. This world is very fragile. And I I don't feel like it takes much to break it. So I started Glass World with with that perspective in mind. And I started it from a place of honesty. I wanted to be very truthful about um, my lyrics, about where I was coming from. Um, and I, I wanted it to come from a very real place. So I spoke a lot in on our EP, actually, that about uh, relationships and, you know, the ending of things. And I spoke very openly about um, friendships and how those could end, too, and family and how, you know, just this wide array of things that I never spoke about in my previous band. And um, we're doing really well, actually. We released a new single um, uh, about two months ago, and it's been, you know, received very well, which is always important with new music and a fan base that, you know, has um, in the opening stages of getting started. And so that was received well, and we're just moving right along with writing an album. Um, I'm hoping that it'll be um, available this year, by the end of this year. It just depends on the writing process, of course. And we uh, were in the, I don't know, I don't want to call us hardcore, but, you know, we're in that hardcore, heavy, um, but we sing a lot too <laughs> genre. So <laughs> it, it's it's always one of those where I always hesitate to classify us or to put us in any, any real category because I feel we are what we are. Um, we're just passionate and uh, driven and we try to keep things uh, to just express that musically and lyrically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, people can check it out for themselves and see what they think. For um, sure. And you guys are, yeah, and you guys are based in Ohio, right? Yeah. Yes, Cincinnati, actually. Yeah, so if we have any listeners in in that area, then um, you guys do shows around there? Yes, we do. Uh, We're actually pretty booked up for the summer, too. So we'll be hitting a lot more areas other than Cincinnati. But but yeah, we definitely play Cincinnati probably every month, I would say. We have a show somewhere in Cincinnati. That's great. Yeah, so... uh... So maybe, you know, anyone's listening and they're they're in that area, they could uh, they could go check you guys out. Um, so Beth, I wanna um, ask you the final question that I have for you today. Okay. And that is given what you know now, if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I think that that would have to be to not be silent. You know, I went too long without telling anybody anything, you know, and I went too long without even uh, recognizing it to myself. So I think tell someone, uh, write it down, get it out, um, just something so that it's not just inside of you, you know, for years and years and years, and then you end up in worse shape than you were to start with. Um, I think that's very important to, to find your voice and to use it. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, I, I was silent for many years before I talked about what I had gone through with the bullying. And um, I think in some ways, you know, that that did a lot of damage in and of itself and maybe even uh, was more damaging than the bullying that I experienced, right. you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, it the definitely things can you put be. Your, yeah, the things you put yourself through when you're keeping it all to yourself, it's not good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, even if it's someone unbiased, you know, like a counselor or, or if it's someone that, you know, you feel very close to, whether it's a parent or you know, a boyfriend, you know, or a friend or, you know, whoever, it it should, it should be talked about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, at least there are some uh, resources out there where people can, uh, can do that and, and do that safely. Absolutely. 
Yep, that's great. Um, all right, so before I let you go, Beth, um, how can people connect with you? Um, let us know the website for your band and all that stuff. Sure. Um, well, anybody can uh, add me, like my page on Facebook. You know, Facebook is kind of the, the central hub, I feel, for a lot of communication these days. So just type in Bethany Durbin, my musician page will come up. I'm very active on it. You know, I reply to messages. I I respond to people very quickly. Um, And also my band, my band is on Facebook. Um, It's just facebook.com slash glassworldband. All right. Sounds good. I will have that linked up on your show notes page. Great. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for coming on here today and for sharing your story with us. Um, I think that, you know, it's it's definitely going to be an inspiration to those listening to hear about how you've been able to you know, overcome what you've been through and and to get to where you are today. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Honestly, I, uh, I, I've talked about it, like I said, very publicly for a few years now, but I, I still get help from it, you know, just the same, uh, through as many of these things that I do. So thanks for having me as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 78. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Beth Durbin to find the links uh, mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I guess the one thing I want to reiterate here from today's episode is Beth's answer to the final question I asked her, and that is to get your story out there and don't be silent. That's something that we've talked about here in the past, and I'm definitely going to take the opportunity to talk about it again because I think it's such an important message. Of course, it's not always easy to be able to do that, but you know, at least there are uh, places out there online where you can you can do that. You can even do it anonymously if you have to, and it allows you to just get it out there. You know, I can at least say for myself that keeping silent was one of the more harmful things that I did, and. I just don't want to see, you know, you go through that as well and to keep all that bottled up inside and, you know, keep yourself from getting the help that you need and getting the support that you need. But all in all, I hope that you enjoyed this episode and definitely come back next week. Um, I actually don't know who that's going to be with just yet. I haven't recorded that as of the time I'm recording this, Um, but there will be an episode. So be sure to come back and, and check that one out. I'm sure it's going to be a good one. And just as a reminder, if you want to check out that deal from Audible, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Audible, and you'll be able to get your free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial if that's something that interests you. And of course, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Have hope.